Let's begin with a word of prayer. Just, Father, I I ask that you would bless these words and that you would give us grace today, that you would lead us and teach us, give us understanding, that you would direct our study, that you would use it to edify your church and those that are being joined and called to your church daily. Have mercy, Lord. Provide the bread of life for them here as we come and knock at your door and ask that you set it out before them. We have a stranger that has come who is in need of bread. I ask that you would give them life, Lord, that you would open their eyes and their ears, that they might see you and know you and know the truth of your saving power. In Jesus' name, amen. And I wanted to start a little bit about doctrine and this part from 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw yourself. But godliness with contentment is of great gain. And I wanted to refer to those who say that doctrine does not matter, that we all basically believe the same things and anybody who assents to this opinion because it is not prudent for a Christian character to assent to there being other Christianities than that which is written in the Bible. It's not true. It's a lie and it's a damnable heresy to void the Word of God and to accept another Christ that is made with hands is a damnable heresy. And he tells us right here, if anyone does not consent to sound words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is proud knowing nothing. And he tells you to withdraw yourself from these people. Withdraw yourself from them. So it does not say to stay in fellowship with people of eight or nine different doctrines where everybody just believes whatever's in their own heart or in their own mind and they serve a God of their own creation. That is not what God says says that we must search diligently in what is written in the Word of God and we must abide in the Word of God, that we must derive our doctrine from the Word of God. And another point, he says it a little bit more clearly. And he said, though we or an angel from heaven were to preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So that means that even if an angel from heaven, a miraculous angelic being, appeared and materialized in your room and gave you another gospel saying, this completes the gospel of Jesus Christ, you would think that that was surely a sign from God, right? Well, no, he says that that is not a sign from God at all. That is the devil. That even if an angel from heaven appears to you and tells you to go after another gospel, Let him be accursed. And by another gospel, he means any gospel that's not from the Bible, that we have not preached, he said, meaning the apostles, who wrote down as prophets of God, the word of God. The Bible says that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Again, it says that all scripture is God breathed, is breathed from the mouth of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in godliness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished or equipped unto all good works. So the doctrine and the Bible is is good for reproof. That means to confront somebody in their error to correct them and how do we do this if we pretend that doctrine doesn't matter the scriptures are to confront errors in our brothers or those who call themselves brothers but the bible says if any man says he is a brother who is a fornicator 
who is participating in many of these sins openly, that we are not to have fellowship with them, not even to eat with them, that they may be ashamed. The Bible says if somebody says that they are a brother and they are living in gross and open sin without regard to the truth, that we are to abandon fellowship with them that they may be ashamed. They also should be put out of the church, is what the Bible says, for a time. So that they are either consumed by the devil entirely and they are purged from the earth from their own sin or that they feel so ashamed that they come back and they relinquish their evil and submit themselves unto their brethren because he says that you are supposed to be a holy lump a new lump a holy lump therefore put out that wicked one a wicked person from among you saith the Lord. But we do quite the opposite in our days. We do quite the opposite. We put out the man who says that doctrine matters. We put out the man who says that sin matters. We put out the man that says that holiness matters. Because, O Lord, why have you hardened our heart from thy fear and caused us to err from thy ways? That men should depart from the holy doctrine of God's sovereign power and grace and the doctrine, the holy doctrine of election. And that's what he says, if anyone does not consent to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is proud knowing nothing. So when Jesus says, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And you teach that Jesus does not have power over every single person on earth. You, it says, are proud and know nothing of Christianity. Because those are the words of Jesus Christ and we should not only consent to the words, the sound words of Jesus Christ the Lord, but we should submit to his words and be reproved by his words. Because that's what all these reason that God has breathed forth the scripture so that the man of God may be complete and equipped to perform good works which God has ordained for them so the scripture is to correct us in our errors not to ignore and pretend like all error is just basic Christianity that's not the truth that is the voice of the devil and if any man teach otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, meaning the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing. These are men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth. From such withdraw thyself. O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called. I wanted to turn now over to the second epistle to Timothy. And... It talks of a premonition about the state of Christianity in the end times, the state of the world. There's a couple of powerful statements that are laid out. And God tells us why it's grace. God tells us why it's grace. It's so that we glorify God. Jesus is the one who says that, To those that are outside, all things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should turn and be converted, and I should heal them. Or as it is written, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart. So it is God, God who has blinded their eyes but yet they teach against this they teach that i am not one who is blind and they completely missed the point of the parable where the blind man had received his sight and as soon as he had received his sight jesus went and gave him his sight back 
the Pharisees confronted him and they put him out of the temple. They confronted him and put him out of the temple and they went to his parents to inquire of them whether that was really their son and whether he was really born blind because they didn't even believe. And they put him out for confessing that Jesus Christ has given me my sight, though he did confront them and explain that it was quite amazing that they did not understand that this man is from God. Because since the beginning of creation, it's never been heard that a man has opened the eyes of someone who was born blind. But yet, I see, he said. And because he glorified Christ, he was put out of the synagogue. He was put out of their fellowship. He was rejected by them. Now, in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 6, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. How astonishing that the scripture teaches that all scripture is breathed from the mouth of God and is profitable for doctrine. All scripture is breathed from the mouth of God. There are endless sermons about the mood or feelings of Paul, about the author's original context, author's original audience. Does God teach that? Or does the man who you're listening to teach that? God does not teach us any such method of Bible interpretation as to pretend it is not written by God. This is, in fact, a great evil. A tremendous evil. The opinions of Paul had nothing to do with what is written. Paul, doubtlessly, wrote hundreds of letters. But they are not all anointed. They are not all part of the canon. They are not all the word of God. These are specifically, it says that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Meaning, the word of God was not spoken by the will of man. That these have nothing. The Bible specifically forbids that interpretation. It says that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spoke, not of their own fancy, but as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And it says all the prophets had the spirit of Christ which was in them. All of them. That this is, in fact, the Word of God, and God is the original author, and the audience is those that hear the Word of God, because he says, My Word is like the rain, it goes forth, and it waters the ground, and brings forth the seed, and it brings forth and bears fruit, and so my Word, which proceeds forth out of my mouth, will not return to me void without accomplishing the reason for which I have sent it. Amen. It is the Word of God. It is a gross abomination for any man out there to take away from the power and authority of the Word of God as to pretend that Paul had anything to do with this. The Bible forbids it. It forbids you for teaching this heresy. And the great dangers of this carnal interpretation of the Scripture is that they're teaching you that he's not speaking to you when he is. They are teaching you that the book of Corinthians is nothing more than a history book written to a Corinthian church, to which we are to glean through and to examine what we can take from what God was saying to the church at Corinth. But that, the words have gone into all the world. Many times, his original audience had no idea what he was saying. Jesus was, a, was almost constantly he said to those that are outside, all things are done in parables. They're 
written in a spiritual mystery kept secret from the foundation of the world, a hidden wisdom given only to Christians to understand and to interpret the spiritual meaning of the Bible. And that's why they do not know that this is the Word of God. They don't even know it's the Word of God. They think this is the Word of Paul. They think that that's the Word of Luke or Matthew or Mark or John, and they're wrong. God says they are wrong. That Luke didn't have any private interpretation involved with writing the Scripture. Not at all. But he spoke as he was moved by the Holy Ghost. Luke's opinion, his profession, it matters not. It is the Word of God. God is the author. The audience are those who are blessed enough to hear it. And the reason they would like to detract away from this is because there's many things in the Bible they don't want to apply to them. They say, well, whoa, well, he was talking to someone else. That doesn't matter for my life. It doesn't matter. Well, if you put it that way, the entire Bible is not written to you. Every single book is addressed to a specific grouping. The book of Timothy is written to Timothy. It's Paul's letter to Timothy. And you're saying this has no relevance on us today? That we're just to consider? Well, that's not written to me. This is the same line of thinking that goes along, and this is present very much in the Reformed churches as well. This is the same line of thinking that goes back to the Old Testament is a history lesson. And the reason is because it is a book that is sealed before them. Because they've not been born again and they do not perceive that this is the Word of God. Because it is by faith that we perceive that the world was framed by the Word of God. It is through the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ that we perceive that it is indeed the Word of God and that we submit to it as we should. They do a great disservice. This is not a small subject. This is not a small offense. It is a tremendous offense for any man to pretend that the Bible was written by men or that any man had any personal influence. This tells me you don't trust the authority of God's Word. You don't trust the authority and God says it's absolute that on the day of judgment he will open up the books and you will be judged by the words he has put forth into this world. You will be judged by the Bible, what the Bible says. In fact, the sharp sword goeth forth out of his mouth and with it he should smite the nations. It is the word of God. I will make my words in your mouth fire in this people wood, he says. That this is the authority. It is the law that has been given. Jesus said, He that hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. He has one that judges him. The words which I have spoken unto him shall judge him in that last day. When they came to Jesus, he was giving a lesson. It's quite compelling. There was a large crowd of people surrounding him. And there's Jesus teaching and he tells them, do not murmur among yourselves. Don't fight among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. So he told them, don't debate, don't fight. No man of his own power can come to Christ. No, he said, do not fight with each other. No man is able. No man is able to come to Christ unless they are specifically drawn by the power of God. And when he said this, Many of those that followed him, that big crowd, they left and went away and they did not follow him anymore. And his, his response essentially was, do you see that I told you? All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out, for I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which have seen the Son, and believe on him shall have everlasting life. So he, they asked the disciples, when all this great crowd went away, will you also go away? And they responded, 
Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said unto them, Have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. Let's turn back to Second Timothy, now that we've laid the groundwork here. Wherefore I put you in remembrance, in verse 6, that you stir up the gift of God, which is in you by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And what he means by this is not just the appearing of our Savior on earth to be crucified, but again, what did he tell the disciples before he went to be crucified? Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me, because I live, you shall live also. And so they asked him, how is it that you're going to manifest yourself to us and not unto the world? And he told them, he that has my commandments is he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and we will love him and make our home with him. We will come to him. So he says that he will reveal himself to his people after his resurrection from the dead. That they will see him and know him. And I'm not talking about visions, because I do not believe it is, is quite what he's talking about. But it's about the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. Where two, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am amongst them. It is Emmanuel, God with us. Or as he says, the kingdom of God is within you. To have the Spirit of Christ and to be united with Christ. Now it says again, that's what he means by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who has abolished death. And we see he's brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And so this is why... We can understand it that way because life and eternal light and immortality, he is brought to light through the gospel. Now, are all men in the light? Do all men have immortality and eternal life through the gospel? We just read, many will be judged by the word of God. On judgment day, many will be damned by the word of God. But he's speaking to those who have received immortality and light through the gospel and those also who have seen the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against the day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard from me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermonogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. 
the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. And he's saying that the fruits he's referring to are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And if we seek to labor, we must first be partakers of the fruits. We must first be converted and born again. We must be delivered from the power of sin or else how can we properly teach the freedom that can be had in Christ? Or will we not cover and hide our sins if inside we have nothing more than a guilty conscience? There is a lot being said today, a lot of works being taught that divert greatly from the simple message of Christ. Now I wanted to pause for a minute because in the beginning of 1 Timothy, we were just reading this yesterday, and we'll begin in verse 3. And I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So again, doctrine matters. In fact, you are commanded that you teach no other doctrine. He tells us to command them that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. For we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any such thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So anything that is contrary to sound doctrine, there's another new word we introduce, sound doctrine. This means the doctrine of Christ. So if there's anything that's contrary to sound doctrine, that's what the law is for, to condemn you, to be damned as a sinner, to condemn you, guilty. And it says that the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart. And this is the command that God gives us. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man laid down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. No more do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. So the end of the commandment, so the essence of Christianity can be told in love from a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. If we swerve away from the end of all of the commandments given for Christian life, which are love out of a pure heart, of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned, and I do not want you to take away from what he is saying.
You say, well, fornication is a sin. Fornication is not loving your neighbor. Fornication is you gratifying your own flesh at the destruction of your neighbor. Because you know God says he will destroy them for this sin. That all fornicators will be in the lake of fire. So you, you are gratifying your own self at the expense of their damnation. This is not love. Love does no evil to his neighbor. Love does no evil. To lead someone away from Christ is not loving them. So the entirety of all Christian doctrine, it stems from love, a good conscience toward God, and faith. And as we swerve away, and there's many, many laws, many, many rules, many, many actions that are laid out moving forward, but it says that there is Christian liberty. The Bible teaches of Christian liberty, that we have imputed righteousness, and that the works of righteousness which we now do, we do by the faith of the Son of God. That it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Or that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing but the Spirit of God. And there are many, many rules that are in the Bible. That's clear. But that's not the purpose those laws are written, it says. That the law is not written for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. Without faith, a man does not believe that the Word of God is, in fact, the Word of God. So he will not obey it. He will not follow it. He also does not have a clear conscience, meaning his conscience is either seared or it's bruised by hearing the Word of God because he's haunted with his own wickedness and he puts it away from him. Now let's turn back here to 2 Timothy. We do not steal because we love our neighbor. Because God tells us to do unto them as you would have them to do unto you. And we do not like to have our property stolen. So if we are to truly be following Christ, then we will not do this harm to others. Now verse 8 from the book of 2 Timothy. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It's a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. So he talked about how he is persecuted, how he suffers trouble and is slandered as an evildoer, even unto chains and imprisoned as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. And that he lived his life chaste and persecuted and receiving lashes, imprisoned. He went through all things for the elect's sake. And the modern preacher teach that there's no such thing as an elect. The election, they call it Calvinism. But the elect are the entire reason that Paul endured the many, many sufferings that Christians face. And he also said it's the reason that we too should endure their slander, their lies, their casting our name out as evil. They're casting the doctrine of Christ out as evil and fighting it and spending all day fighting against the doctrine of God's sovereign power and grace and salvation. What a great, great evil. But we endure all of this for the sake of the elect. And we don't know who they are. And they could come to us and be our enemies. They could be our persecutors. They could be standing watching the crowd throw stones at us till we die, as Paul was. And we should endure all things for the sake of God's elect, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. 
And the other point is that when you preach the gospel, you preach a message that the world cannot hear or cannot see. You preach the gospel, which to them that perish is foolishness, but to us that are being saved, it is the power of God. And God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It's not about looking cool or getting as many people to come in and to listen to you as possible. It's not about great swelling words of vanity or anything to try to convince the mind or to try to be a pleaser of men. Because all these things, according to their doctrine, is how they get people into the kingdom of heaven. By getting as many of them to choose to live this way as possible. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible is a hard message. Many times, many times, it directly confronts all manner of sin and evil and wickedness. It confronts false prophets. It confronts the world. The Bible teaches us to not be a friend of the world or else we make ourselves the enemy of God. It teaches that just to simply be a friend of the world, you have declared war against God. You've declared yourself an enemy of God. God Jesus oftentimes was not necessarily nice as we would describe it because he has compassion on souls and careth not for the person of men and he does not do his works to be seen by men and in fact yet he had done so many miracles before them yet they believed not on him the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spake Lord who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed therefore they could not believe because that he saith again he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and turn and be converted and I should heal them. Study to show thyself approved. Now again, it says, it is a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. To deny the gospel of God's sovereign grace is the quickest method to become a successful one of the churches. But it is not a way to save people. It is a way to ensure that they end up damned. And because most of the world, it says that we know that the whole world lies in wickedness. And we know that we are of God. So the entire world loves the false gospel a, a much greater degree. But the Christians are committed. They have no choice. And they're not the same. There's not multiple doctrines of Christ. There is one doctrine. And he says there's no debate. He orders us not to murmur amongst ourselves that we are just to consider and to know that no man can come to Christ unless God himself directly brings them through his own power. Not their power, not their will, not their action, not anything they have done, but God draws them to himself. We're told not to debate. We already know what God says and we're told to consider that they care not for the truth, that they care not for the gospel that they disdain the teachings of God, they disdain sound words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to withdraw ourselves from these people. We should not shake hands and say, I consider you my brother. And it does not matter that one of us is fighting against Christ with all of his might, and one of us is desperate to make up for the damage that has been done. Most of the opposition you find when you preach the gospel, it comes in the form of people who say, I'm already a Christian. I do not need to read that book. I do not need to read Bible tracts because I already have accepted Christ. That they refuse the gospel now because they've been given something different. They run into their Mr. Worldly Wisemans of the world who have led them astray as they were on the path to eternal life. And now 
they remain in bondage because the law does not lead to life. There has not been a law given to which a man could attain unto righteousness. And in fact, all Israel strive with all of their might, attempting to attain and to establish their own righteousness, and they failed because they did not submit themselves to the righteousness which is of Christ, the righteousness that comes from Him. If we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we suffer, we shall reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. If we do not believe, yet He abides faithful. He cannot deny Himself. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. So again, not to strive about words to no profit. Are they an open book? Are they accepting the word of truth? Are they consenting to sound and wholesome words? If not, they are words of no profit, and you should not strive. Do not cast your pearls before swine, lest they turn on you and rend you. And they will. But by God's grace, we suffer all these things for the sake of the elect. And you know not who they be. They could be your worst enemy. They could be your greatest adversary to your doctrine. So I do not suggest that we not preach the gospel unto the heathen, but that you prepare yourself not just to believe, but to suffer. Because if you want to be a Christian in this world, you will walk alone or with very few. And you will have an entire world of enemies. If you want to know if you're preaching the gospel, does the world love it? Do people who frequently engage and frolic in sin like to hear your preaching and talk to you about how inspirational it is? Then it's short, certainly not the Word of God. They should be terrified to be in your presence. They should hate you. They should want you rid of the earth. They should want you to die so they no longer have to think about their own evil and wickedness. This is the nature of the carnal mind in regards to the children of the woman, the free woman. It says that the children of the wicked one are at enmity with the children of God. The children of the flesh at this day, it says, persecute the children of the spirit. That this is the reason they persecute you. This is the reason they fight against you. It is not because of you. It is because of Christ. And if the gospel you preach can be easily accepted among carnal people, you be sure you're not preaching the gospel. Sometimes God does work revival. And he does bless an audience that many can become saved as they hear the preaching of the word sent down by the Holy Ghost. And they are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and receive life upon hearing the preaching of the gospel. There are many in this condition, but there are many more. Though they hear, they do not hear. Though they are told, they do not perceive. But shun, study to show thyself approved unto God, it says in verse 15. Amen. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat at doth a canker, of whom Hymenaeus and Fallacius who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrowing the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I'm going to move down. Actually, let's continue. But in a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore shall purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, 
charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. So if people are asking questions not from genuine, uh, genuine need to know or to learn, but they're asking questions in order to only gender strifes and difficulty and confrontation, do not engage with them. Do not debate with them. The Bible says they do not have truth. There is no time to waste in a debate. And certainly do not lift them up and pretend they are brothers, as we have seen recently with some of those debates between, uh, uh, yes, these, these Arminians and others that have recently come out. Mike White, I think his name was. but And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men apt to teach, patience, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. So it does not say that they're Christians if they oppose the doctrine of Christ and if they fight fiercely against the saving grace of God. But in fact, it says that they oppose themselves. They oppose salvation for themselves. They oppose the gospel for themselves. They oppose themselves. And we are to be patient and not strive but to be gentle, again, Jesus says, to be harmless as doves, but wise as serpents. That means that we need to be patient and able to teach, always advancing, always moving forward, if sometimes by inches rather than feet, in meekness or in humbleness, anticipating great resistance from them, sometimes even physical, that we may be instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth so we are to be patient because it's very possible it is possible that God may give them the gift of repentance so that they are able to acknowledge the truth that God might have mercy on them and give them Repentance, that they would turn back from their dead works. Repentance from dead works is what it says. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Very compelling statement. So those that oppose themselves and that resist the truth of the saving grace of God, it says that they are not free. Their will is certainly not free because they're taken captive by the devil at his will. So they are servants of the will of the devil, not their own will. There is no free will, the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches against free will constantly. Constantly. The entirety of the Bible is one giant condemnation about any ability of man. And the only reason the church is constantly are pushing free will today is because they have abandoned God and they are his enemies and they are seeking to destroy your soul and yes there is a remnant there's a remnant a very small remnant and if the Lord had not left us a remnant we'd already have been like Sodom and been like Gomorrah but God has left unto us a remnant a seed and it does not matter if the whole world goes off after lies. It's because they are not free. This is why we are to have compassion on the sinner and why the self-righteous hate the sinners. And they won't, they won't fraternize with them. And they talk bad about them. And most churches today kind of have that country club feel where all the do-goods are angry and upset about the can't-get-rights. Why can't they just be more like us? Why can't they be able to make better decisions like we are? But that's not the way God works. God's not a respecter of persons. He's not going to give you eternal life because of any special qualifications that exist in you. Who are you and what makes you to defer one from another? What do you have that you have not received? And if you have received it, why do you boast? as though you had not received it. 
That's what he says. That's the condemnation against those who claim to have pulled this power from inside of themselves. It's a condemnation. And this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Amen. And this is exactly what he's talking about. It's the same message again. They have a form of godliness, but they deny that the power is of Christ. They deny the power of God to save a sinner, the power of God to direct a sinner, God working in man both to direct his will says it is God who works in you both to will and to do so God is at work in his people to direct their will their wills not free God is directing their will and what they do this is what God says yea let God be true and every man a liar you must abandon all false doctrine and false preachers because the Lord commands it and you have heard having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Yes, the Bible says doctrine matters. Anyone who puts any emphasis on the greatness or power of man or the, the eloquence of the will of man in achieving eternal life for himself is a damnable heretic denying the power thereof from such turn away for of this sort are those that creep into houses they lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with diverse lusts ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth so they're always learning but they're not able they are unable that's what we talked about the heart of the gospel being the inability of man the inability of man or as some of the former reformers put it the depravity of man meaning the incapability of man pleasing God in the flesh that actually it says it word for word those that are in the flesh cannot please God so in your flesh without the Holy Spirit you can do nothing to please God. You can do nothing. You have nothing to offer but sin. A great heavy weight of mounting sin that hangs upon your head, ready to burst forth and plunge you into judgment. You have nothing that will recommend you to God. And the moment you realize it is the moment you are closer to salvation than you've ever been. Amen. The whole point of the scripture is to show us that we are evil. And we are in desperate need and we are blind and we are maimed and we are broken and we are the lepers the whole point of the scripture is to inspire within your soul a cry from a broken heart God be merciful to me a sinner to show you this and not to clean up your act and to try to prove to God how worthy you are what a great sin and wickedness and they're not able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're ever learning. They're not able. That's what it says. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. The term reprobate, reprobate is castaways. Those that are impossible to be reconciled to the faith. Concerning the faith, they are reprobates. They are those that are not chosen toward faith but they shall proceed no further and their foolishness will be revealed unto all men as theirs also was but you fully known my doctrine manner of life purpose faith long-suffering charity patience persecutions afflictions 
which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them, and that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Again, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. This means God breathed. All Scripture is breathed from the mouth of God. God has written the Bible. God is the author. It is the Word of God is what He teaches. Anything else comes from the mind of man. Whoever teaches against the teaching of God and does not consent to sound words is proud, knowing nothing. But all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So if you want to learn how to be righteous, you need to learn from the Word of God. Amen. If you want to be profitable or to be, be corrected, you need to learn from the Word of God and we need to submit to the Word of God. If we have a doctrine that does not agree with the Word of God that we hold, it says here, we are to be reproved. We are to be corrected. Now that you hear that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, I wanted to turn over to the book of Isaiah and in a sermon that I was reading by Jonathan Owen called Perilous Times, he described the time toward the end of time in which the Holy Spirit would depart from the churches and that men's hearts would be hardened from the fear of God. And it was a great sermon. I actually read it again myself and we published it on our channel if you want to check it out. It's just called Perilous Times by John Owen. And I wanted to turn here to Isaiah 63, which is one of the chapters he, he highlighted there. And he's speaking here, Wherefore thou art red in thine apparel, thy garments like him that treads in the wine fat. I have trodden the wine press alone. And I wanted to pause. And who is he talking about? It describes that the Word of God, or Jesus, in the end of time, at the Day of Judgment, there's a big wine vat, and he's trampling the things that are present in the wine vat, and they are all of those that are damned, and the unbelievers, and the false prophets, and those that come against him. It says he tramples them underfoot, and their blood, it comes up to his garments. So when he says, I will tread them in my anger, I have trodden down the wine press alone, he's this, we're, we're listening to the words of Jesus speaking. Wherefore thou art red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treads in the wine fat. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. And I will strain, stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And so this, he's talking about the day of judgment. The day of judgment, when his enemies are trampled under his feet and their blood comes up to his girdles. So here he's speaking in the person of Christ. Remember, this is from Isaiah 63, but all scripture is breathed from the mouth of God. It is the word of God. The original audience had nothing to do with it because he's not speaking to an original audience. He's speaking for this time, for the end of time. That's what he says, the day of vengeance. I will tread them in my anger, I will trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. And I will stain my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in my heart. The year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help. I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. 
and I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury. I will bring down their strength to the earth. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel wherein he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindness for he said surely they are my people children that will not lie so he was their savior and in all their affliction he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them in his love and in his pity he redeemed them and carried them and carried them all the days of old but they rebelled and vexed his spirit therefore he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them then he remembered the days of old Moses and his people saying where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of the flock and we know that Jesus said I am the good shepherd and he says that he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out and they go in and out and find pasture and they follow him my sheep they follow me because they know my voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow so here he's talking about Moses symbolically because when he referred to Christ he says behold I will raise up another unto you like unto me and this was Moses who said that and him shall you look for your salvation but again he brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock where he has put his Holy Spirit within him and led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name that led them through the deep as the horse in the wilderness that should not stumble as the beast that goes down into the valley the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest so didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory where is thy zeal and thy strength the sounding of bowels and thy mercies toward me are they restrained doubtless thou art our father Though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, Thou, O Lord, art our Father, our Redeemer. Your name is from everlasting. And so Abraham does not acknowledge them. The physical Israel does not acknowledge them. But yet the people that is speaking back and pleading with him refers to God as their Father, as their Father, and as their Redeemer. And that they lift up his name as being from everlasting and they pray O Lord why hast thou made us to error from thy ways and hardened our heart from thy fear return for thy servants sake the tribes of your inheritance the people of your holiness have possessed it but a little while what a great sorrow the people of God's holiness only controlled the land for a very small time our adversaries or the enemy has trampled down your sanctuary we are yours you never bear us rule over them they were not called by thy name oh that thou wouldest rend the heavens and would come down that the mountains might flow down at your presence as when the melting fire burns and the fire causes the water to boil to make thy name known to thy enemies to thy adversaries that the nations may tremble at thy presence at this stage I should add in that if we cannot yet perceive that he's talking about the end of time and the return of Christ it should become apparent because he talks of the melting fire burns and that he would come down and to make his name known to his enemies because previously his enemies are ignorant of him that the nations may tremble at thy presence when thou didst terrible things which we looked not for you came down 
the mountains flowed down at your presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him, and rejoices, and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, you are wroth, for we have sinned. In those in continuance, in those is continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf. So this means all of our righteous sacrifices that we do, thinking that it's pleasing to God or that this is how we earn heaven, we should understand that God views every single good deed we do on our own as a filthy rag, as nothing but garbage or refuse, as a menstruous cloth, that all of our righteous deeds, they are filth to God. There's at no point he smiles and says that this is a path that will cause me to give you salvation. Now, there are some that will slander at this statement and say that we slanderously say, let us do evil that good may come. Nay, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? But it says that we should not work toward our salvation, but look to Christ and to plead with Him for salvation and to deliver us from our sin, from our wickedness, and from the bondage of the devil, that we should pray that God would grant unto us repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, so that we may be recovered from the snare or the trap of the devil, that we may be recovered from captivity to the devil and set free from Satan who rules over our will. It says we are taken captive by him at his will. And we need to be taken captive by Christ and be at his will. Amen. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So every good deed you've ever done is not something that will recommend you to heaven. God views it as a filthy rag. And we all do fade as a leaf. The Christian does good works because he is thankful and because he loves God and because it is his nature. He's been born again. God has worked a miracle in his heart and now he serves God. What does this have to do with his will? He's been changed, his heart taken out and he has been given a heart of flesh that we may obey his commands. So the Bible says that we cannot obey the law of God naturally. We must be born again. It says it in Romans 8. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. Okay. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name. There is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirs up himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. So it says that God has hidden himself from these unsaved individuals. God has hidden himself and he's declaring that there is none that calls on him. There's none that actually would stir up himself to take hold of Jesus. There's none. Again, it's echoed in Romans 3. There's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that doeth good. There's none that understands and seeks after God. They all together have become unprofitable. The poison of asps is under their lips. With their feet, they are swift to destruction or their feet are swift to mischief. Hmm. And again, But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, 
Thou art our father. Our, no, thou art our potter. We are all the work of thy hand. Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee. We are all thy people. So here it is his people crying out to the Lord, confessing that he is their father, that we are a created thing, we are a vessel, we are the clay, and that he is the potter, and that we are his workmanship, that he creates whatever he desires, that we are subjects, and that if we would only be blessed enough that God might reveal himself, we could be restored and reconciled to God. That's the ministry of Jesus. It's one of reconciliation to God. Of being restored to a right relationship with God. And again, the holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house, where our fathers praised you, is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Will thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Will thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? And this great sin is found here in the chapter, that there is none that stirs up himself to take hold on thee, and yet there is an entire army of people who claim that this is exactly what they have done, and they will put out the people and servants of God from among them. They will force them away from them and call them evil and mock them all day long. Their efforts are not devoted to serving Christ. Even if they pay the tithe and sing songs and read from the Bible, they're not devoted to Christ because they fight against the true gospel of God's sovereign grace. I thank you, Lord. I thank you and bless these words and I thank you for the study and give us grace and let the hearers find grace from you, Lord. You will provide eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.